I'm gonna put on my hat. Oh yeah, here we are. Here we are. Oh, that is way better. Right. Hello there, lovely people on YouTube as well. Uh, hope you appreciate I got a little bit dressed up for you today <clears throat> as I've been doing my Tales of the Switzerland and my visits to the 10th anniversary orchestra. But that is not why you're here. You are here for Tour de Lore, episode three, Outlands. As we've taken Smelly's Oval through Kalimdor and Eastern Kingdoms, they have now arrived at the very first expansion, Drelanim, thank you very, very much, for World of Warcraft. To set the stage, at this point in time, we had like the heroes of uh, the Sons of Lothar who had stepped through the Dark Portal. And uh, we had Illidan in Warcraft 3 who teleported to Outland and all the good stuff. But for years, people had not seen this place. Yet here they are, Outland before them. And for me, at the time, when this came out, this was my very first expansion. And the guild that I was in, Vlad the Cool, actually won a beta key. So, imagine my shock and surprise when Hellfire Peninsula was going to be the next leveling zone. They were expecting me to turn over my hard-earned epics and wear, gr ep uh, wear green items. And so, I dipped out. And I decided, you know what? I don't need to play WoW anymore. I'll go and get a life. And then I came back and tried out the Draenei, which still wasn't really for me. But the story here, what is the idea behind it? Okay. We gotta go a little bit in... in as the music definitely reaches a crescendo. There we go. Um, we gotta go a little bit back in time. In the time that Sargeras was forming his Burning Legion and he had taken on the Titans, Sargeras realized that he needed some brain power amongst his army uh, in order to help him, uh, you know, guide the troops and guide the demons. And so he had come across a race called the Eredar on a little planet called Argus. And he was like, I'm going to recruit those people into my army and it's going to be great. They'll be my my leaders, my, my champions. Now... The people of Argus were ruled by three people. We had Velen, Kil'jaeden, and, and Archimond. And um, Kil'jaeden and Archimond listened to Sargeras' words, and they were like, ooh, power, knowledge, everything we, we, re we need, really. This sounds like a really good deal. Let's join the Burning Legion. But Velen, Velen had in his possession something called the Atamal Crystal, which, up to this point, is still very much a mystery, even to this day, like, how exactly did they get the Atomal Crystal? How is this connected to the Naru and the Light? Which might actually be a really interesting thing to play out in the upcoming storytelling. Uh, if we're doing the whole Light versus Darkness, why did the Eredar have the Atomal Crystal? But regardless, this crystal allowed Velen to see the future. And he could foresee that teaming up with Sargeras would mean the doom of the universe! Yes, they would be powerful and knowledgeable and the world would be at their feet. But they would be corrupted and horrible and horrific. And they would be manari. That is the term for something twisted and horrible amongst their people. They did not want to be manari. So Velen gathered those that he could. And with the aid of the Naru, escaped the planet of Argus. But he left behind his son. And he left behind his close friend Kil'jaeden. And Kil'jaeden, who had signed up with Sargeras... He was like, hey, hey, what are you doing, man? You're breaking my heart. I love you, Valen. Don't leave me. And so he vowed that even if it took him thousands and thousands and thousands of years, he would capture Valen and the now so-called Draenei, meaning refugees. Um, and the hunt was on. So from planet to planet, Valen and the Draenei, um, exiled ones, refugees, exiled ones. Exiled ones. Um, Draenei and the Velen, they would hop from planet to planet, and uh, Kil'jaeden and the Burning Legion would chase them down. And every single time that Kil'jaeden and the Burning Legion were close, they got a message from the Naru like, Hey! Danger! Danger! We gotta go! Get into the ship! And so they did, and they hopped off the planet. Now, what might be interesting for future storytelling in the realm of speculation is maybe there are some Draenei colonies out there that actually stay behind and whatnot. But that is realm of speculation for future storytelling, maybes. Uh, ultimately, <clears throat> the Draenei arrived on a little planet called Drenor. And you might say, hey, that sounds familiar. Draenei, Drenor, was this planet waiting for them? Nah, the Draenei called it Drenor. 
And the others that live there, like the orcs, they were like, ha, we actually really like this term. We will use it as well. They so they also called their planet Drenor. It was great. Now the Drenai no longer had a way to escape because the Naru that helped them out had gotten ill. Um, you can still find them in... If I could show you, we could still find them in. Let's fly over there. Uh, in Oshugon, which is basically their spaceship. Uh, the Naru had fallen ill, and so the Drenai had no way of escaping. But Kiel Jaden did not know this. And so when the Drenai were tracked down again, um, Kiel Jaden was like, hmm, you know, they've been running away for millennia now. Let me play this safe. Let me play this the clever way. Let us do it the sneaky way. Instead of showing up with the Mighty Legion, let us make use of the resources on the planet. And so Kiel Jaden started his work, his plans, and he decided he was going to use the orcs on the planet of Draenor to wipe out the Draenei for them. Now at this point in time, the orcs and Draenei, they were living on the same planet, and they've been not best as buddies, right? It's not like they would invite each other over for the weddings, but they weren't exactly enemies either. So, once upon a time, there was Duratan, Frostdad, and there was Orgrim Doomhammer. They were, like, chased down by an ogre, and they were saved by the Draenei, and they were invited in for dinner with Velen, and Velen got a chance to talk to the orcs, and, you know, it was great. Great times. But they weren't exactly joining each other's campfires either, and for the orcs, they were very much living in clans and honor and Loktar, but they would have a festival in which they would actually come together at Oshugan, and they would celebrate the ancestors, the clans would come together, communications would happen. But little did the orcs know that in Oshugan, which was like their sacred mountain, inside that Naru was ill. And for some reason, when Naru fall ill, they start sucking in the souls of the departed. Don't ask me why. It's, it doesn't really fit the current storytelling, but that's what they do, okay? They try to recover and they try to suck in the souls of the departed, which is why Oshugan became such a sacred mount to the orcs. And they had the Kosh Ark festivals, and they got together, and they had a grand old good time. Um, but then Kiel Jaden was like, okay, I'm gonna use these orcs. And he showed up to the orc Nerzul. And he showed up not as Kiel Jaden, he showed up as, as the part of wife Rokan. And, you know, he started whispering to Nerzul. Those Draenei are up to no good. And what you should do is you should bring your people together, right? You're stronger together in numbers, and you should you should you should wipe out the Draenei. They'll kill you if you don't. They'll get to you if you don't. Oh yeah, by the way, I, I probably can hook you up with some power as well if you want it. And Nerzul also had an apprentice called Gul'dan. Uh, and at the time, Nerzul was still very much shaman, but Kill Jaden had other plans for the orcs. They were going to not only drink demonic bloods at some point. They would also embrace the fell, like warlock powers, right? And uh, they were going to magically age their children in, an, in to prepare for war. As the horde was being formed, Nerzul rising up as like a leader figure. Um, all in the name of the ancestors, mind you. All very much in orcish culture. Like, the orcs honored their ancestors and they followed their wisdom and their will. So when Rokan, when their speaker Nerzul started to talk about, you know, the ancestors are telling us to do this, the orcs followed. The orcs followed their lead, and slowly but surely, the orcs became more and more corrupted. Um, not all of them were blind to what was happening, right? Some of them could definitely see, like, huh, ancestors do seem a little bit murdery. What exactly did these Draenei ever do to us, you know? Um, but what can you do, right? Like, you might have suspicions... But are you really going to be able to prove that there's a gigantic space devil corrupting your people and your race? Not really. And what would exile mean in a world where you're told that the Draenei are your enemy? So someone like Duratan, who had history with the Draenei, who had history with Velen, he was very conflicted. Because on the one hand, he was like, this is the will of the ancestors, right? On the other hand, he was like, Draenei don't see murdery. We're the ones that see murdery right now. I don't know if this is the right call. Either way. In front of us, by the way, you can see the orc ancestors as we are in the spaceship. Um, there are plenty of warlocks around here. Um, but yeah, you know, with, with warlock power being embraced by the orcs, the elements of Drenor were also like, well, you don't want to be shamans? F you, we, don't wanna, we didn't want to be with you anyways. So the elements turned their back on them. 
Um, and it wouldn't be until Thrall, so you can imagine how long that took. It wouldn't be until Thrall that they actually got shamanism back amongst their people, right? Here's an Aru Kuore, or Kur. Um, the Draenei inside of the spaceship, sucking in all the ancestors. So yeah, kill Jaden, slowly but surely, corrupting the orcs, turning them into the hordes, and making them ready for war. Eventually, the Draenei started to notice, like, huh, you know, we weren't always friendly with the orcs, but they do sure become murdery right now, wonder what's going on. So they try to talk, they try to negotiate, doesn't really happen. Um, more and more, the orcs are pushed up to the point where they're like, you know, drinking the blood of Manoroth, the Pit Lord Manoroth, demonic blood. Uh, Ner'zhul eventually does find out, like, huh, this whole Rokan thing and his ancestor thing, it's a scam. He, he finds out that Kil'jaeden has been manipulating him, and he kind of wants to turn against Kil'jaeden and be like, nah, I need to save my people, I need to steer away from this fate. Unfortunately, by that point, it was already far too late, and he had a little apprentice, again, Gul'dan. And Gul'dan didn't particularly care much about the orcs. Um, Gul'dan just wanted power, and Kil'jaeden promised him power, so that's what's gonna happen. I believe that it was Gul'dan who put in uh, Blackhand as, as war chief of the hordes, uh, but in the background, there was the so-called Shadow Council. Gul'dan was ruling the horde, was pulling the strings from behind the scenes, and more and more the people were let into darkness. Now... Throughout the War of the Draenei, uh, we would see that the orcs would lay siege on uh, the temple of Karabor, which was like this holy place amongst the Draenei. You probably know it best as the Black Temple. Uh, that used to be a holy site for the Draenei. There was also a big old battle in uh, Terekar Forest at Shefrev. And basically that's where the Draenei um, got their last stand going. So... But at that point in time, they kind of figured out, like, okay, there's corruption behind this, kill Jaina behind this, but what we do, what do we do, right? Like, we can't really fight back. So, Velen needed to survive. The light had shown them that, that whatever happens, Prophet Velen and the people, um, he needed to survive. So, a lot of brave Draenei decided, Prophet, you are our leader. Go hide in Zangamarsh with some of our people. We're going to stay behind in Shefrev. And we will hold the orcs. We will hold the line. We do not expect to win. But we need to sacrifice X amount of our people. In order to uh, make the orcs believe. Or make Kill Jaden believe. That the mission was successful. That they had successfully wiped out the Draenei. And so they did. And during the Battle of Shefrev. I believe just before the Shefrev fight. That is when they drank the demon blood for the first time. With a uh, Gromash Hellscream rising up. And be like yo I'm going to be the first. Here by the way we got the elements of Draenor. The, the Furies I should say. Hello there. Um, and at Shefrev some really cool stuff happens. So we have Gul'dan fully embrace the powers of the demonic legion. The Fell. The Darkness. And amongst the orcs, there was something called the Red Pox. And the Red Pox, if memory serves, is like... It's, it's like a disease, right? I think it's the reason why Garrosh was not part of the main army. He had, like, Red Pox. He was sick. Uh, but Gul'dan took the Red Pox, which I think has his roots in the curse of Anzu. I think. And he combined that with, like, uh, Warlock magic, Fell magic, with, with everything that Draenor had. And they, they made something called Red Mists. And this is a weapon, a nuclear weapon that's been used in like one storyline. And um, this this weapon was thrown over the barricade into Shefrev, where the Draenei were trying to hold the line. And those inside of the city, they breathed it in, right? <gasps> and then something happened, which is kind of insane. They could no longer call upon the lights. They were literally disconnected from the light. And that is, as far as I know, the one instance in the Warcraft lore where you can actively disconnect someone from the power in the, in the case of the light. We've had stories before where someone was like excommunicated and believed or made to believe that they could no longer use the light. And in that case, um, they, they basically, because they believed it, then they followed it. Um, but turns out that the Red Mist actually can do this. And then it started to de devolve the Draenei that breathed it in. And it turned them into the Broken. And the Broken... You might know a character called Nobundo. Like Tyrion, exactly. Um, the Broken... Were the survivors of Shefrev. Were those who bravely stayed behind in the city. To give Velen and the others that were hanging out in Zangamarsh. 
Um, they were giving them the opportunity to survive. So when the survivors of the Siege of Shafrev left the city and tried to follow where the other Drenai had gone, did the Drenai celebrate? Did they welcome them with open arms? Were they like, oh my god, you all survived? Oh, I'm so happy you survived. Come here, have some soup, have a place to live. Come, come hang out with us. No. Instead, the Drenai were like, um... Now, I know that you did a really heroic thing, right? But you kind of look gross, and I'm not sure if your disease is contagious. Um, I would appreciate it if you would stay away. And we're just gonna, we're gonna let you uh, live out in the Zangamarsh, just not in our village. And so the Broku were sent away by the rest of the Drenai to live out in the wilds. And um, this is probably still one of the more effed up things the Drenai have done. Is it frozen for anyone else? I have audio, just video. Um, no, not on my end. Try refreshing it. It is not on my end. So here, um, as long as they don't kill so far, like you can see the Drenai. So the Broken were just left to their own devices. In the Zangamarsh, disconnected from the light, disconnected from their people. And that was only the start, because over time, their devolvement went further and further. And they started to lose themselves. And over time, there were those in their camp that just walked, up, that tried to find like the nearest cliff that they could just throw themselves from. Um, because not to mention that this de-evolution was happening... Those that were captured by the orcs in Shefrev, like there's a reason why there's a Corona half orcan, right? Um, the war between the orcs and the Drenai was all kinds of effed up. So, yeah. Eventually, we have a Nobindo who sits there and ponders about his life and is like, is this really what the light has guided me to? Disconnected from it? Suffering? Is this really what my destiny is going to be about? And on the wind, he hears a voice, not that of the light, he hears the call of the elements. And so Nobundo embraces the shamanistic powers as one of the first amongst his people. And then, and only then, <laughs> did um, they show up again at their, at, at their city and they offer to the other Drenai, like, look, I know that we are horribly, horribly transformed and transfigured and mutated, but we can be useful now. We can help. And Velen was like, hey, what are you doing? Let them in. They're amazing. They're, they're, I've seen visions. We should totally let them back in. And so they did. But yeah, that is the corruption of the... Um, Orcs and the Hordes against the War of the Draenei and Kill Jaden and the manipulations. Now, when the job was done and Kill Jaden believed that they had won at Chefrev and that, that the Draenei had been wiped out, he didn't particularly care about the Orcs. He didn't care about Gul'dan or all the promises that he had made of power and all the good stuff. He didn't care that the planet had become so corrupted that water had become a scarce resource. He didn't care that the Orcish kin had turned green and that the demon blood pumping through their veins turned them crazy and hostile towards each other. He did not care. His mission was done, and so he left the Orcs to their fate. And now Gul'dan was in a bit of a pickle. Gul'dan and, and Blackhand, because more and more voices were rising up and, and pointing fingers at those responsible for the corruption of not only their planet, but also their race. Gul'dan was in a bit of a pickle, but luckily for Gul'dan, there was another that needed the orcs. From a far-off world called Azeroth, the corrupted guardian Medivh made contact with Gul'dan. And if you might remember, Medivh had like the spirit of Sargeras inside of him. Sargeras is the leader of the Burning Legion. So where Kill Jaden started, Sargeras was going to finish it. He was like, I have use of these corrupted orcs. I have use of such a powerful army. I want them to come into Azeroth and weaken the world so that the Legion can take over. Um, so he made contact with Gul'dan and he, you know, taught him how to make the Dark Portal. Gul'dan went to his people and he's like, hey, I got plans you mean Gromash? What do I mean Gromash? What? I mean Gromash what? Um, so he made plans with Gul'dan, they made the Dark Portal, and um, they connected Drenor with Azeroth. I heard Garrosh. I, I don't know what you heard, Krivan. Don't know what you heard. Don't know what you heard about me. But Gul'dan was shown the Dark Portal, you see. 
and he was shown a delicious world which had food and water for his people and so they were not going to claim his head and yeah they made the dark portal and at this point in time Duratan of the Frostwolf clan he had always been against what their race had become but he couldn't really massively do anything against it um, besides I believe he prevented his clan from drinking demonic blood but that was about it um, so when Gul'dan opened up the Dark Portal and they sent, like, the scouting party, they saw this world, they were like, okay, cool, we're good to go, we're gonna invade Azeroth, it's gonna be great. Uh, unfortunately for the Horde, though, it wasn't gonna be great, because Azeroth was not without, without its defenders. We would see the rise of the Alliance of Lordaeron and the closing of the Dark Portal for the first time. Then... When the Horde lost, I should explain, when the Horde lost that war, we would see that Gul'dan actually betrayed the Horde in order to go to the Tomb of Sargeras. He had found out by scanning Medivh's mind, aka Sargeras, that there was like the Tomb of Sargeras, where the Avatar Sargeras, the thing that Medivh's mother had fought and that then possessed her, that still had a lot of power in there. And Gul'dan was all about that power, so he was going to find the Tomb of Sargeras and betray the Horde, um, which in turn... Someone like Orgrim Doomhammer, who had taken over and wiped out the Shadow Council, was not going to stand. And he was going to go, for the sake of honor, have his people take care of Gul'dan. But it did mean that the Horde was going to lose the war. The Dark Portal was closed off. But they still had a corrupted planet. They were still stuck on a world that was dry and did not have water or food and the people were starving. And so Teron Gorfiend, the Death Knight, right? The same Teron Gorfiend that you fight in the Black Temple... He, sh he walked up to Ner'zhul and he was like, listen, Ner'zhul, listen, right? I know that the whole Rokan thing and that the whole Horde version and that the, our lives have not exactly been great. But what if, right? What if we don't invade Azeroth again, but instead we go to different worlds? And Ner'zhul was like, what? That's crazy. Let's do it. And so they did. So they reopened the Dark Portal. They went back to Azeroth. This time, not to conquer Azeroth. This time, they were going to um, gather powerful relics in order to open up more portals to different worlds. So we're going to get the uh, Scepter of Sargeras. They're going to get the Book of Medivh, the Skull of Gul'dan. Uh, there was another thing. The Book, the Scepter, the Staff, the Skull, whatever. They, they got like powerful relics in order to make more portals and invade other worlds. But the Alliance of Lordaeron would find out what they were doing, right? And they had to make the call. They were like, nah, we can't let other worlds face the devastation of the Horde as we had. And so they stepped through the Dark Portal in order to stop the Horde once and for all. And they got really close, right? They built up Honor Holds. They uh, took on the, 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 the Horde forces. They, they did, like, raids. I, at some point, there was also Deathwing. The connection to Deathwing is that the Black Dragon aspects, he had felt the opening of the Dark Portal. And in his mind, he was like, ooh, boy, another planet to conquer. I am Deathwing. So he approached the hordes and he was like, hey, listen, I'll help you get your relics and your artifacts. I will give you the support of the Black Dragonflights. In exchange, I want you to bring my ex into your world. And so the horde did. And Deathwing actually came with them once they had like those powerful relics. And then he claimed the Skull of Gul'dan. He was like, Ner'zhul, I want the Skull of Gul'dan. I can feel that there's power in there. And Ner'zhul was like, ah, the Skull of Gul'dan has done what it needed to do. I will give it to you, all right? So now Deathwing had the Skull of Gul'dan. And with it, he went into the Blades Edge Mountains. Now, the Blades Edge Mountains, they're not empty. They are home to the Grun. And uh, there is Gruul the Dragon Slayer, right? Who was like, hey, get out of here, black dragons. You do not belong in this land. This is my land. Get out. And then the Alliance of Lordaeron was like, okay, we're going to need the Skull of Gul'dan in order to shut down the Dark Portal again. Catcard figured this out or whatnot. So they needed to get the Skull of Gul'dan out of the hands of, of the freaking black dragon aspect Deathwing. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Well, ask him. He's not going to give it. You know, not nicely anyways. How are you going to do that? So they went there. And clever Ketgar was like, okay, I'm gonna go into battle. They got the aid of Gruul the Dragon Slayer. He was not called the Dragon Slayer at the time, but he was gonna earn that title. And Ketgar tried to use his magics on Deathwing. But Deathwing was like, look, little mage, listen, right? I was dabbling in magics before you were even an, a little spark in the eyes of your ancestors. I'm like 20,000 years old, if not more, probably more. What the heck are you going to do to me? I am Deathwing. But 
if you know a little bit about Deathwing's story, then you know that Deathwing is a little bit corrupted by using the Dragon Soul. It's all different storyline. Either way, he has plates that are holding him together. And if you take away those plates, Deathwing kind of falls apart. And Ketgar, he was like, well, if I can't use my magic against you, I'll just use it on the bolts that are holding you together. Now, that was clever. And he forced the Behemoth to retreat. And not just that, he was also kind enough to drop the Skull of Kuldan on the ground. I don't know why, but he did, okay? Don't ask me why, he did. So, Ketgar got, like, the Skull of Kuldan, and they eventually, they confronted Ner'zhul, and they tried to stop Ner'zhul from uh, opening up these portals. Everything has kind of gone bad for Ner'zhul and the Hordes, because the Alliance of Lordaeron is fighting against them. There was, like, massive explosions, there's Akundun, and, you know, nothing really went according to plan. There was Trevelyan in the light, Terongor got his ass kicked. Um, it wasn't exactly going well for Ner'zhul. But he had gotten to the point where he was like, you know what, F this, F all of you. I am ready to betray the Hordes. I am just going to open up these portals. I'm gonna go elsewhere. F the Horde, F Draenor, I'm done. He opened up his portals. He stepped through them. The Alliance of Lord Realm was not able to stop him. And now, across the already extremely corrupted world of Draenor, portals started to open. The Twisting Nether started to blast out. For those that don't know, if you, stop, if you step through a portal that's created by like a mage or whatnot, you basically step through a tear in the Twisting, redder, in the twisting Nether, which connects different domains together. So it's like... Oh, imagine like a zipper opening up, and you go like, whoop, straight through it, right? You go through the Twisting Nether. Um, so at that point, for Arnair Zul, he would end up straight in the hands of Kill Jaden. Not the best of times, not gonna lie. We'll get to that when we get to the Wrath of the Lich King. But in the case of the Alliance of Lordaeron, they're like, oh, snap, what do we do now? Because this planet is gonna blow, right? And they were like, the detonation, the explosion, the, the corruption of this planet is most likely gonna blast through the Dark Portal if we don't do anything about this. So... Again, they make the sacrificial play, and they decide to close off the Dark Portal from Draenor's side, and I believe this sent a... I don't know if it was a random one. Either way, they, they send a Wild Hammer Dwarf through the portal with, like, the Skull of Gul'dan. And Deathwing was also able to get through the Dark Portal before it closed off, leaving behind his, his dragons and his axe, right? Because that's why we went into the zone. Um, when you go around here, you can actually see the remnants of the Black Dragons. And if you've been catch if you caught up on the story of Dragonflight with uh, the Return of Sibelian, um, this is where Sibelian's been hanging out. So Sibelian is the, the son of Deathwing. And uh, when Daddy abandoned them, Sibelian stayed behind. And he had to keep the Black Dragonflight together during Draenor's transformation into Outlands. Because those portals... They did indeed blast all that magic out. Um, and it basically transformed the already un incredibly corrupted planets of Draenor into Outland as we know it today. And with the Dark Portal closed off, we would see that, uh, for example, the Frostwolf clan, they were stuck in Azeroth. Uh, Gromash and the Warsong clan, they were stuck in Azeroth. Rexar was like, F the Horde, all you do is betray each other, I'm out. Garrosh was still in uh, Draenor, which we now call Outland. He didn't know what happened to his father. All he knew was um, that his father was the first to step up to drink the demonic blood offered by Gul'dan and Manorov. So, you know, he didn't exactly think the highest of his daddy. And, um, yeah, the Alliance of Lordaeron also stayed behind. So in the case of um, Illyrian Trevelyan, they would be picked up by the Army of the Lights. Curdran went into um, Shadowmoon Valley. Then we have a Ketgar who was in Honor Holtz. There was a Dunnoth. Yeah. Those. One, two. I'm feeling like I'm missing one. No, I'm not missing one. Nah, because Trellian is standing in front of Stormwind. Yeah. Uh, so they were on Draenor, now Outlands. And uh, yeah. You might think to yourself uh, Colonel Wildhammer and Dunnoth Trollbane. Yes, did I not say Dunnoth Trollbane? Sorry, did I forget Dunnoth? Oh, poor Dunnoth. Now you might think to yourself. Okay, so they closed off Outland, right? We have no idea what happened to our heroes. That means that Outland is inaccessible to anybody. But I'm here to tell you that that is a filthy lie. We left those people to die. Yeah? Nobody cared enough to go and find out. Mm. Trollbane is in Honor Hold, if I remember, right? And Ketgar will move on Honor Hold into Shefrev. Yeah. Um, by this, I mean, 
Warcraft 3. And in Warcraft 3, which is the continuation of the storyline, so Warcraft 1 and 2 is basically like uh, the opening of the Dark Portal twice and shutting it down. In Warcraft 3, we would see uh, Illidan Stormrage. Illidan, during the War of the Ancients 10,000 years ago, was no friend to the Burning Legion, but he was like a double agent. And his ego, it prevent or, you know, his way of playing it safe, I suppose, prevented him from sharing too many details with all the other people. Basically, he was branded a traitor. They imprisoned him for life, and then they gave him immortality. Ha ha! What a joke. He was also not allowed to hurt himself, so, yeah. Um, but then, the Legion, as Illidan had promised, returned, and Tyrande Whisperwind set him free. Illidan goes out, and he's like, Tyrande, for you, I will still shrimp after 10,000 years. I will do what you tell me to do. Even if my brother tells me, oh, you are such a bad guy, I will still do this. So he did. And he goes out and he finds the Skull of Gul'dan. The same Skull of Gul'dan that we just spoke about. And the Skull of Gul'dan was being used by the Burning Legion to corrupt Felwood. Illidan takes the Skull of Gul'dan, absorbs his power. <laughs> as you do. Now, did he need to absorb his power? No. But he still got the mission done. Like, why not both, you know? Why not both? If you can save the forest and get yourself a bit of a power upgrade... Why would you not do this? So he did. And then Malfur and Toronto show up. And they go like, Illidan! I can't believe what you have done, my power-hungry, egotistical twin brother. Illidan! Did we imprison you for 10,000 years and you learned nothing? Have you enjoyed a succulent Chinese meal? You have made yourself a demon. Be gone, brother of mine. You are exiled from elven lands. And it's like... The fuck? This is literally why you set me free from prison. Why am I being punished? But whatever. Whatever. Illidan was gonna find his own way. Illidan is then approached by Kill Jaden. And Kill Jaden is like, listen, 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 Illidan, right? <clears throat> I, uh... <clears throat> I, I, uh... I hate to say this, but, uh... <clears throat> I need your help, Illidan. Really, Kill Jaden? What's the matter? Well, you see... I once upon a time got my hands on this delicious orcish spirit called Ner'zhul, and I tormented it, and I ripped it apart, and then I turned it into a Lich King, right? But it turns out that it can become more powerful and out of control, and so now I need you to go and take care of him. Really, Kill Jaden? You cannot control your own creations? No, I need your help, Illidan. Will you do it or not? And Illidan was like, yeah, uh, sure, why not? So Illidan went on a mission to take care of Ner'zhul, the Lich King, who at this point was sent over to Azeroth to, like, corrupt and dominate, and again, weaken it for another Legion invasion. He had Arthas, Archimont was summoned into the world, blah, 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 big old story. Moral of the story, point of the story, is that Illidan... Illidan sucks. Not, not really, but he failed in taking on Arthas, okay? And Arthas and Frostmourne were able to kick Illidan's ass. So Illidan had to hide away from Kill Jaden. And he decided that the best place to hide away from Kill Jaden <laughs> was the planet that Kill Jaden had corrupted. Outland. How did Illidan know that, that how did Illidan know how to get to Outland? Anyone's question. Is anyone's guess? I I don't know if they ever gave like a proper answer to it, but Illidan was able to make a gateway into Outland for some reason. And he would gain the support of a Lady Vush. I still, um, I think in the Chronicles they explain, like, his connection to Azara or something like that. But it was still a little bit vague. And there was, there used to be speculation about Vash and Illidan actually be a thing, but that never really became a thing. Uh, and he also had Kilfa Sunstrider and the Blood Elves. Now, Kilfa and the Blood Elves had to sacrifice the Sunwell after Arthas used it to resurrect Kelfuzad. They had to sacrifice the Sunwell, and then they found out, uh-oh, whoopsie-daisy, we are actually massively addicted to the magic. Illidan... You like magic. Do you have ways to help us out? And it was like, ah, oh, young kill. I have been a crack... <laughs> Sorry. I have been a magic user for over 10,000 years. I can hook you up with the good stuff. You stick with me. I will I will hook you up. Good. And so, Kael threw in his lot with Illidan as well. And they went into Outland. Now, fun little detail. If you look at the Road of Glory, the Path of Glory even, you might notice a little uh, thingy magic here. These are the bones of the Drenai. They were slain by the orcs. Was there ever a reason that they had to make a road out of the bones of the Drenai? No. Not really. But it is metal as fuck. Okay? 
They made a road all the way to the dark portal. Like, these are all bones. Yeah, you can count how many skulls there are on screen. They made a road out of bones. Elon created a portal to Outland by using a small rift left behind from the portal Kelvis out it used. There you go. It's aesthetically pleasing. All right. At least five. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so Illidan hides out on Outland and eventually, together with Fush and Kilfus, they decide to secure the planets for their goals. And they go around closing off the demonic gateways that were bringing in more and more demons. Um, they kick the crap out of the pit lord, McFarradon. But don't completely kill him. They actually imprison McFarradon and they use his blood to create more um, powerful orcs for his army. Uh, like basically, Illidan made himself the Lord of Outlands, right? And there were orcs there that were willing to side with him. And he gave them a double dosage of blood. So they had the blood of Manoroth in them. And then they got the blood of McFarradon. And they became red. Which is kind of cool. I think Karg of Bladefist as well. They all joined Team Illidan, right? Um... Keofus would set up in Netherstorm, Lady Vash in Zengamarsh, and Illidan would go into Shadowmoon Valley. And he would go to the Black Temple. And the Black Temple, as we spoke about earlier, was once upon a time the Temple of Karabor. But it was already corrupted and darkened by Gul'dan and his Shadow Council and all the, the stuff that happens. But there was still the broken Akama who remembered what the temple used to be like. And in desperation... He was like, you know what, maybe this Demon Hunter, maybe this Illidan Storm Rage, maybe, just maybe, he can be the salvation of our temple. If I and the Broken at my side join Lord Illidan, maybe we can liberate the Black Temple and turn it back to the light side. Now, obviously, it was a foolish hope. It was never going to happen. Uh, but that is the reason why Akama joined Illidan. And once the job was done, Illidan did not uphold his end of the bargain. He held the Black Temple for himself and for his forces and for his Den of the Lights, as you might recall. Which, of course, meant that Akama was kind of pissed. But don't worry, Akama is brewing plans. He has an ally in the form of Maiev Shadow Song. We'll get to that in just a moment. So that is basically setting up the stage for um, the ending of Warcraft 3, right? And at this point in time, again, Azeroth has no idea what happens to um, the people on Draenor, now Outlands. The Dark Portal has been closed for all this time. Um, they don't know. And in Classic, we wouldn't find out. But then, in the Burning Crusade, you would have that intro cutscene. Banished from my own homeland. Imprisoned for 10,000 years. And now, you dare to set foot in my realm. You are not prepared. Uh, the Dark Portal had reopened, and I believe it was the world boss. Now, I don't know what his name was. Maybe it's in the Dungeon Journal. Was it Doomlord Kassik? I think it was Doomlord Kassik. Good job, Brain. You're on fire today. I think Doomlord Kassik opened up the Dark Portal. Why? Well, Kill Jaden was still pissed off at Illidan. And he was like, you know what? I used the orcs once upon a time to wipe out the Draenei. What if I use Azeroth to wipe out Illidan? Right? Solid plan. Worked before. Let's do it. So they opened up the Dark Portal. And they brought in Azeroth, because Azeroth did not know, and this is a little bit of a retcon in the lore. Um, like in the past, in the Burning Crusade, Illidan was just a bad guy. And the lore, it wasn't really at the front stage, right? Like if I compare it to what they did with Wrath of the Lich King, where they actually honored what came before Warcraft 3, I would say that with Burning Crusade, Illidan, they were basically, remember Illidan? Here he is. Remember Lady Vush? Here she is. There wasn't, there was a story, but not massively, you know what I mean? But then, people asked, like, hey, listen, Mr. Madsen, sir, we really like Illidan. Could we bring him back? And Madsen was like, yeah, I like a redemption arc. Would it be cool? Yeah, it would be kind of cool. We could do it. And so they started brewing, and they started doing, and with Legion, which is many expansions in the future, they came up with a somewhat redemption arc for Illidan, a new storyline. And this is, like, one of those examples where retroactively messing with your story does not always have to be bad. It can actually work out. I think, personal taste, that the story of Illidan as it is now is way better than what they gave us with the Burning Crusade. So, as I said, Azeroth comes through the Dark Portal and we are led to believe that Illidan is just this bad guy because, let's be fair, he's been doing a lot of bad guy things. But Illidan, he's been doing it with a purpose. And he's been doing it with the same purpose as he always had, which was take out the Burning Legion, right? 
So all the things that we see that go down in Outland were done with that reason. Like Illidan was the one who was like, I don't care what it takes. I will do whatever it needs to do. Uh, I'm going to get this done. And for us, on our side, we would get... Um, we would get two different kind of experiences when it comes to questing, if I remember right. I believe in the Grand, which was... Okay, so the Blood Elves would actually join the Horde in this time period, and the Draenei would join the Alliance. And the Blood Elves are basically self-explanatory, I think. But the Blood Elves came in due to the help of Sylvanas Windrunner, who used to be a High Elf herself. And her connection with the now Blood Elves allowed them, you know, a little foot in the door. Come on, join the Horde. It's going to be great. Whereas the Draenei... These are the survivors. So this is Prophet Velen and the Draenei that have been hiding out in Zangamarsh. And in the time that they've been hiding out, they've been praying a lot. They've been calling out for aid in the Great Dark Beyond, which is Warcraft's term for space. And Ketgar at Honor Holt has basically been doing the same, right? And what did you know it? <clears throat> Their calls were answered. Do -do 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 -do. Hello? Yeah, this is the Naru. What? You need to pick up me? I got you. So the Naru, Adol, and the Tempest Keep, which is an interdimensional spaceship station, they showed up erp, next to Outland, like, hello, everybody, we're here, we're ready to save the day. We are the Naru, what up? So they go across the world, and this is when Kael'fuzz and the Blood Elves were like, mmm, that looks like a tasty little space station. Mmm, I wonder if we could take it. I wonder. So... Velen and Adal, they, they set up base in Shefrev with uh, Ketgar as well. Um, and eventually, they get like visions like, oh yeah, we need to get onto the ship. And so they go into uh, Netherstorm, where the Blood Elves have taken over the Tempest Keep. They've taken over these ships. Uh, as well as they've stolen one of the Narus, which is called Mu'uru. And they sent Mu'uru back to uh, Silvermoon, the Blood Elf town. Now, I've spoken about how the Blood Elves really like magic, right? You might remember in the intercut scene how they take like a mana worm and they go nom nom nom. They suck out the magic out of the living being. It's their racial ability. Yeah. Yeah, they were not shy of using the same methods on the Naru and steal their lights. So they got themselves a Naru and it went nom 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 and they got headaches from it, but they still did it. Poor Mauru. Anywho, there was a gift from the Lord Kilfas and um. Velen and Nobundo and the Draenei, they let like a raid on um, Exodar, which was part of the Tempest Keep. And they took over the vessel. This is where Adal was hanging out in the middle of Shafrev, right? And here we got Ketgar. Now, Ketgar did not look like this at the time, okay? At some point in time, I believe it was Draenor, they were like, you know what? We really want Ketgar to look like Dadgar. So they took his crusty old face and they made him into this. And they also gave him Atyash. And they never explained why. They were like, oh yeah, you know, magic or something. And it's like, did Ketgar wake up one day and it was like, you know what? I would really like to be hot. That's what I want to be. Um, I guess. But anyways, this is this Ketgar now. So Velen and the Draenei, they make the run on uh, the Exodar, but little did they know that the, Dre that the Blood Elves had sabotaged their ship. And so when they went across the Twisted Nether, they went towards Azeroth, they made a crash landing. Oily, thank you very much for the 35. Um, they crash landed on Azeroth, but thankfully they did make contact with the Night Elves, they joined the Alliance, and then the Dark Portal opened up and they came back into Outlands to join it all, Ketgar, and that whole battle. Uh, against Illidan and the Dark Forces. So, first point of entry. I believe that the experience is pretty much the same. Right, that's what I was talking about. So, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there are like Horde specific quest lines that are not available to the Alliance. And what's really interesting is that the Horde gets a quest line in the Grand, which is all about the Naru and Oshugan and the ancestors, which is really important for the Draenei lore. But if you play a Draenei, you would never see it, which I always thought that was kind of, ha, interesting. Um, but let's do it zone by zone, shall we? Let's do it zone by zone. So we got through the Dark Portal, and we find out, like, okay, cool. Uh, demonic forces are on the attack. Kiel Jaden was, like, manipulating us. And meanwhile, Illidan uh, was also sending out his, his form demon hunters, because he had, like, his private army, uh, in order to help us out from the shadows. But again, Illidan couldn't make direct contact. So we come in here. And on the right side, we got, like, the throne of Kil'jaeden. 
Which, if I remember right, was the spot where they offered the demonic blood to the hordes. I think, if I remember right. Hello? Cool. Hello. Um, was that on Dreno? I'm trying to remember now. I think this is the spot where they offered the demonic blood and then they marched onto Shefrev. Uh, so we got the magical gateway of the Dark Portal. We spoke about that. Honor Hold was basically the Alliance of Lordaeron's major setup at the beginning. Now, obviously, one of the big things that people remember here is uh, the robots walking around and making their noises. There's Fralmar, which is then the Horde setup, the Horde base that they made going on. Uh, I think Rokan actually got something to do here. Hang on. Excuse me. Oh, Nosgrel. And Taijin. Ha! Huh, I thought there was another Shadow Hunter here. Hmm, okay. Nasgrel. Yeah, I don't think Nasgrel gets a whole lot to do. Wasn't Nasgrel like a major advisor to Warcraft 3? Maybe. I think I should know these things. So, okay. We we reconnect here. We get like the Elias of Lordaeron uh, at Honor Hold from the books and whatnot. We also see Hellfire Citadel, where uh, we find out that there are the fell red orcs that have double dipped in demonic blood. We take care of MacFarren, who has been imprisoned by Illidan. And they're using it for the dastly deeds. We also find... Now, we can't check this out on the Horde character. But on the Alliance, you could go to the inn. And you would actually find Arator. Uh, Arator is the child of Illyrian Trevelyan. However, he did not always exist. He didn't exist until the Burning Crusade, if my memory serves. So... Um, they retroactively added the part where Arator existed and they gave him up. Right? And he shows up here and he's like, I have visions of my dad dying on this planet far away. And, and no matter how, how hard I try, I can't hear his voice or I can't hear what he's trying to tell me. Uh, but, you know, bad feelings about it. I'm trying to find my parents. Now, obviously, he was not going to find Illyrian Trevelyan until Legion. Um, but more to the point is if they added Arator back in the Burning Crusade, why? What were they planning to do with Arator? What was his role going to be? And could we perhaps see that vision that he had back then? Could we see that come back into the front with the War of Inn, for example? Now that uh, Trevelyan and Illyria are once again at the forefront, as well as the whole light versus darkness thing. Um, could his visions from back then still become a reality, I wonder? But that is something to... Uh, that is something for, you know, speculation and who knows and all the good stuff. Um... Demonic forces. Oh, yeah. Enslaved Broken that are working for those demonic forces. Earth Giants with crystals. And I believe that at the Temple of Thralmar, they're also taking care of the Broken, I think. Yeah. So there's the Fell Reaver. Fell Reaver makes noises. Here it comes. Make noise, please. Hey! You don't make the funny noise. Maybe it needs to be a bigger one. Oh, well. <clears throat> I think it was just a reference to Illyrian Trevelyan without having him actually be there. Mm, I mean, it could be. 100% could be. But then, I mean, that is definitely specific, isn't it? As well as since it took so long for Illyrian Trevelyan to come back to the storyline. Mm, I don't know. So, from Hellfire Peninsula, which was basically the first zone. And as I mentioned, my first introduction to this zone was not exactly a positive one. I thought this zone looks absolute trash. But then again, keep in mind, like in Classic and Burning Crusade, I didn't care about the lore. It wasn't until Ralph Gator, Ralph the Lich King that I started to care. So I didn't know that I was looking at like the Twisting Nether crisscrossing across the sky. I didn't know that we were dealing with a continuation of Warcraft 1 and 2. I didn't know any of that. I was like, this just looks like a shitty ass land and it's taken a really long time to go through this. Um, and I never checked out Zangamarsh because Zangamarsh is such an opposite where all mushroomy and naturey and watery and a big part of the storyline that plays out here was part of the uh, speculation back in the day. So we spoke about Lady Vush being part of Team Illidan Stormrage and we were wondering like what exactly are these three trying to accomplish in Outland? What is their plan? And here we find out that Lady Vush and the Naga they um, allied with Illidan the Warcraft 3. They stuck by him all this time, even all the way into Outlands. But we know that the Naga, they are really only loyal to Queen Azara, or so we thought. Now, over the years, we've seen that they are not as devoted and loyal as they were back in the days of the Highborn. 
Because we've seen Naga that have sided with the Legion. We've seen Fel Infuse Naga. We've seen... Void Naga? Question mark. Like, we've seen Naga that have stepped away from the Queen and was like, ah, I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm gonna join someone else. And that is the same for Lady Vush. Um, but back in the day, there was speculation going on that maybe Illidan and the crew were trying to make a brand new Well of Eternity. And the idea behind that is that... With the original well, Illidan stuck his hands in there and he created like these vials, right? And one of those vials is also used by the High Elves to make the Sun Well. What if he still had those vials? What if they would combine all the water of the Zangar Marsh and just make a big old well again? Could they do that? That was all speculation. Uh, but that speculation never became a reality. What they were trying to do was literally, as Vash tells us, control the water. Water is power. If people don't have anything to drink, they're gonna die. And that is literally the depth of their plans that had going on here. They were just going to control the water, and that was going to be it. Um, in Blage Edge... Hang on. I ran out of energy. You heard that this was inspired by Penn Island? Sick. When I... The first time I crossed the Dark Portal, I was amazed by the skybox in the alien terrain and proceeded to get killed by the giant mechanical creature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that music will haunt you. Um, I'm trying to remember for the Zangamarsh, by the way. I think the idea is that what we have now, and I'm trying to like line up the, the Draenor lore with Outland lore. I think the idea was that they once upon a time had a Zangar Sea, and due to the transformation of Draenor into Outland, they became a marsh. I think that is the idea behind it. Uh, because if we compare the maps of Outland and Draenor, they're not one on one. They definitely made some adjustments here and there. Um, but I think that was the idea behind it. Like this would be Gorgrond on the Draenor map, if I remember right. Um, so here we got the Blade Edge Mountains. Like I mentioned, this is like where the big battle happened between uh, Deathwing and Gruul. Um, this is where the Grun took like that title. And what I would find a really cool detail, which is once again added later, like they've added a lot of history to Draenor. And once upon a time, the Titans were going across the universe trying to find more of the kin to wake them up, right? And in the case of Agrimar, he came across Draenor. And he quickly found out like Draenor does not have a Titan spirit inside. But he was intrigued by the planet because he could tell that the spirit of life had dominated the planet. And in turn, the wildlife, the nature had completely taken over and they were going to devour it. They were going to devour the spirit of life. They were going to devour the planet until nothing was left. And Agramar was like, nah, this is, this is not good. This is not great. This is going to be uh, very poor for the planet. Balance is going to be needed. So he created something called the Grunt. And long story short, basically the Grunt was... Uh, a mountainy, rocky creature which took on the nature creatures and it ended up in a draw. It ended up in somewhat of a balanced draw but both creatures would devolve into other creatures. So in the case of the Grunt it would become creatures like the Grun, the Ogron, the Ogres and the Orcs. That is how that evolution would happen. So Gruul the Dragon Slayer, right? He is like a descendant of that creature created by Agrimar. Which is kind of cool. So our boy Gruul. And he earned that with the whole uh, taking on Deathwing fighting here. Um, the details of the dragons on the spikes, by the way, and the, and the ogre still hunting them is really, really cool. Uh, this is also the spot where we find Rexar. We are Horde, yeah? Yeah, we should be able to find Rexar. We could talk about him. Um, again, with Sibelian, Deathwing's whole plan of I'm going to bring some dragon eggs over into uh, Draenor slash Outland. It left a big portion of the Black Dragonflight behind here. And Sibelian tried to keep them all together. Now, they've added a lot more with it in Dragonflight. A lot more that was never explained. Basically, they just left him here uh, with Outland. And they didn't give him much more storyline. So when Raphion was introduced with the Cataclysm and started to spout that he was like the only Black Dragon left standing, uh, a lot of us were already like, yeah, but hang on a minute. What about Sibelian on Outland? Like, you can't disregard him. He's still out there. And the way that they explained it is that Refion just did not know that they were on Outland, right? Okay, fair enough. Refion did not know. And then they did the whole uh, High Mountain storyline where... Oh, God. Ebonhorn came into the storyline. Okay, cool. A dragon that was on High Mountain, uncorrupted all the good stuff. But that still didn't explain what exactly happened to Sibelian and the rest of the flight. And... Retroactively. Where are you, Baron? There you are. They've also given him a new model with new eyes, right? 
So, retroactively, they've added that basically Sabellian, or Baron Sablemane, as he's called here, um, they have a whole bunch of black dragons here. And they are no longer corrupted by the old gods. Why? I don't think that they've explained. It might be because they've been hanging out in Outland all this time. It might be because the old gods are vanquished. Um, either way, when he showed up again in Dragon Flight, he was no longer corrupted by the old gods. And on top of that, he had eggs and dragons to reproduce with. He basically brought over the future of their flight. And so a whole argument happened between Refion and Sabellian as to who was going to be the leader of their flight. Uh, Sabellian actually being a child of Deathwing and Refion being a poser. But ultimately, it was going to be... Um, it was going to be... Ebonhorn. I'm trying to remember what his name is. Come on. Um, Ebonhorn, right? Am I... Yo, my brain is freezing now. Abyssian, thank you. Also Ebonhorn, yes? Abyssian, a.k.a. Ebonhorn. Yes, okay, cool, thank you. Um, yeah, he looks... No, nah, I don't think he's blind, though. But he is here. Uh, S Sableman's... Sableman's... <laughs> Sabellian storyline has us deal with Gruul, the Dragon Slayer, as you can imagine. Um, they weren't exactly friendly with them, considering the whole history with uh, Deathwing and slaying of the Black Dragons. And in that storyline, we also find out that he is friends with the one and only Rexar. Uh, and Rexar is hanging out with his daddy. So, God, I'm trying to remember where he was. Wasn't wasn't the Thunderlords? Um, Moknafal village. There we go. So Rexar is half orc, half ogre, if I remember right. And he was always quite a badass. So when the Horde rose up and they um, started to do the whole thing, the Magnaval were like, nah, that's not our battle. We're not going to do this. Mr. C, thank you much for the 50. Uh, happy you enjoyed this suit as well. So uh, Rexar was like, yeah, but this is also our fight. I'm going to join them. He joined them into Azeroth. Uh, he battled at the Dark Portal. But he was betrayed by like the Warlocks amongst the Horde. There was a lot of infighting amongst the Horde. And Rexar was like, you know what? This is not my horde either. I'm gonna I'm gonna go away from everybody else. The only things that I can trust are the creatures of the wild. Right. Uh, those are the ones that I can trust. F you horde, I'm out. And then in Warcraft 3, he by fate, by chance, runs into an orcish messenger who was on his way to Thrall. And they died from a quail boar attack. So Rexar is like, okay, you rest now, honorable warrior. I will take up your charge. I will take your message to the war chief. And that is how he get back into touch with Thrall and the Horde. And that is how he would become champion of the Horde, as he would lead the whole banner and the standard. And he would go into Fedomor and kill Jaina's father and all that good stuff. Uh, so that is how he earned that title. Um, Lothar. Yes. Uh, how did he get on Kalimdor? That is the question of the ages. I'm going to say swimming. That's how he did it. Uh, meanwhile, the bond between Rexar and his daddy wasn't exactly great. Uh, but and in this storyline, they don't actually resolve it as far as I know. But they, they make some progress, I suppose. Uh, because Rexar was still going to be there for his people. Even if he decided to go with the Horde, he was still going to be there for the Magna Fall. That would never change. Um... Now, I don't want to talk about what they did with Rexar and Battle for Azeroth, but that was basically the story here that happened with the Magnafall um, arc. Uh, as well as we got his daddy right here, Liarux. Blood and thunder. Thrall, huh? Who is just Thrall, apparently. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so that's the storyline that we found here. So that's basically Blaze Edge. We also... Oh, yeah, wasn't Okrala like... Um, so what they did do kind of cool in um, Burning Crusade is that this is the expansion where we got flying for the first time, right? And so you would level through these zones and you'd be stuck on the ground. And then once you got your mounts, you'd be able to access new areas. And these were like mini games that you could earn reputation with. You could get mounts with and bombardments. They really loved their bombardment quests in Outlands. Uh, but you would actually find out about Okrala while you were questing. And then once you were able to fly, you were actually like, oh, snap. Those stories were actually true, and they're right here. And I'm trying to think. I think there was like a little camp. There was something to show. Oh, I'm trying to remember who was chilling there. 
It was a little side perch. And I found out about this because I did a video on it. I'm just for the life of me cannot remember who it was. Let's see if we can find it. God, I'm trying to remember. It wasn't a Leary Archerellion. There was like somebody on a little perch. Oh, yes! There is the blue dragon. Oh, okay. So, there is a storyline in the comics for the Sunwell in which Tiragosa, that's her name. Uh, Tiragosa meets a human. And they go through this whole story arc with uh, the nether dragons and whatnot. And you can find them... Here somewhere, I'm pretty sure. They have like a little camp somewhere. Oh, but for the life of me, I do not remember where they are. Anywho, they're here somewhere. Yeah, Jordan Mace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slow in. Thank you for subscribing. Hello, hello. And what did they do with Battle for Azeroth with Rexar? Okay, so Rexar has this really weird arc in Battle for Azeroth where... Uh, he describes Jaina as like this enemy of all that needs to be taken out. And he's working for Sylvanas. And he hooks Sylvanas up with um, Ashvane. And someone like Rexar is not a dummy. And in the past, where we had like a storyline of Mr. Pandaria. Where we had like a really cool reunion of these characters from Warcraft 3. But Rexar was missing. And then he shows up for someone like Sylvanas. Rexar would not serve Sylvanas. Rexar is not that loyal to the Horde that he just follows the whims of every warchief. Um, so I, I found it weird what they'd done with him. And that storyline never went anywhere either. So, yeah. Either way, let's move on, shall we? Into Netherstorm. Netherstorm is... A collection of stories. We have gotten ourselves the Ephidials. And the Ephidials are very much related to the War Within. Um... So the Ephidials, at this point in time, in the Burning Crusade, they're on the hunt of Dimensions the Old Devouring. And they're on the hunt of Dementius because Dementius ate their planets and their people, or we assume. They enter this big old battle with Dementius. And the, the scrolls of lore tell us that the Ephidials summoned Dementius into the physical world. The big old battle played out. And the technology of the Ephidials allowed them to shield themselves from parts of Dementius' magic, but not all of it. And the things that came through their... Um, through their shields, transform the Ephidials into what we see them as today. Like, they're beings of energy, and they put, like, wrappings around themselves in order to give themselves more form. Um, so the battle with Dementius had the Ephidials cross the universe for vengeance. But not just that. They're also highly advanced. So similar to the Draenei versus the Orcs, where the Draenei are extremely advanced, the Ephidials are as well. They have, like, otherworldly technology. Um, they are traders. They are currency collectors, story collectors. They are not all evil, but some of them are definitely in the direction of I will do anything for power or to get the job done. And in the case of the Burning Crusade, we would ally with quite a few of them in order to take care of Dementius. And what's interesting is that the questline back then told us that there were like millions of Ephedials cheering us on, like, oh, you've taken care of Dementius? Oh, the day is saved! We have completed our mission, yay! But you might already be aware that Dementius is a big plot point of the War Within. So what happened, right? What the heck's going on? Well, it's not... Um, you could call it a retcon if you like. It's it's more like a modification of the lore, I would say. In which... Um, if I would have to give it an explanation, is that Dimensions that we see in Burning Crusade is, is just a very small sliver of its power. A manifestation that was able to get onto the planet. And the real thing is still out there. In a similar vein, that if we go into the Dungeon Journal, and we go to Shadow Lab, no. It's always the last one that I click on, so prepare yourself for that. We go to the Mana Tombs, we read about Pandemonius. Um, Pandemonius, the infamous Void Lord, is known as the Duke of Chaos, the Eater of Nations and World Slayer. Pandemonius was one of the commanders that served under Dementius when the Ephidial homeworld of Karesh was destroyed. He was later bound by the Nexus Prince Shafar and forced to continue sating his unending hunger in service of the Ephidials. Um, so that would mean that we have taken care of a Void Lord in a dungeon. And that is not the story that they're telling these days. Like, the Void Lords... Zalatov, they are way more threatening and way more powerful, right? Um, so yeah, retcon in the form of um, Burning Crusade lore versus what we got these days. Uh, where were we? Right, so we spoke about the Ephidials and the Void Lords. Uh, beyond that, we also got the Tempest Keep. 
And, um... I think this village got blown up by Kilfus and his forces, right? I think that was the idea. Either way, this is that interdimensional spaceship that the Naru showed up with. Like, hey, you need some help. Here we are. And then it was taken over by the Blood Elves. Uh, this is also where you go in to take care of Kilfus. And one of the more interesting things is that the eye... No, sorry. Um... The Architress is like a prison, right? It's a prison that the Naru use. Um, and inside, we would deal with... Oh, God, what was the Harbinger? Yes. And one of the prison cells holds Millhouse Mana Storm. Millhouse is really interesting because my guy shows up randomly in the Burning Crusade as a high prisoner for the Naru. Leaves, does not explain anything. Then shows up again in, like, the Cataclysm, where he's now part of the Twilight Hammer Cult, and he's, like, summoning ultimate doom spells. Then he gets himself a wifey, and he's, like, in the Dalaran prison cells. Mailhouse Manastorm is one of those characters that just does things in the background. Keeps showing up, and is just part of the Mage Legion Order Hall campaign. Mailhouse is a major... <laughs> a main major character that we can all take out. Yeah, Millhouse is phenomenal. So, yeah, this is where Kilfus was hanging out. And eventually, like, the Blood Elves did not know that their prince had fallen to darkness. They knew about his allegiance to Illidan, I suppose. But they wrote it off as, you know, we're doing things because we need to survive. That, that's basically been the Blood Elves since the destruction of the Sunwell. Like, they had to find ways to survive, and they were turned to, okay, let's suck on the fell, let's take the dark magics in, and let's preserve what we got. But eventually they found out that Kilfas had joined Kiel Jaden. And that revelation was a step too far, even for the Blood Elves. So they turned against their own prince, which was huge. Like, can you imagine being Lorfmar at that point? Like, region lord or whatnot? Um, so the Blood Elves, there were some of them that have joined Illidan as demon hunters. There were some of them that were sent over to Shafraf to, like, take care of Adalm business, but they got a vision. And in that vision, they were like, nah, we, we can't stick with Kilfas. We need to join Adal. And then Lady Liadrin and the Blood Knights, the ones that had, like, sucked the Naru light to become Paladins again, they were also like, nah, we, we can't stay with Kilfas, not with what we know now, not with him joining the Burning Legion. So, the reason why Kilfas joined the Burning Legion, by the way, was basically Illidan not keeping his promises. Uh, and, and kill Jaden, manipulating him, whispering to him, like, look, look at that night elf mongrel, uh, not giving you the power promise, not doing the things promised. And Illidan always kept his cards close to his chest, because he did not know who he could trust. So yeah, a rift grew between Kilfas and Illidan. And what's even weirder is that with the green fire questline, which warlocks were given in Mr. Pandaria, uh, this was a questline to upgrade your spell effects, and you would go... Uh, follow Kenrafod, Emelok, and the Council of the Black Harvest. And you would find out more about Illidan. And these were some of the first hints that Illidan was still out there, by the way. Because Illidan's demons were still bound to him or something like that. It was one of the first hints that Illidan was still alive. I don't remember that much. And we'd also go to the Black Temple. Where we find out that under the encounter with like the Three Faces, there's a big old pool of power similar to, to the Well of Eternity. A pool of power that Illidan could have given to kill first in the Blood Elves, but he didn't. And they literally ask, like, why? And they don't really answer. So I don't know why. I don't know. Either way, I do know that Kilfus betrayed Illidan. Lady Vash was lo loyal to Lord Illidan to the end. Kilfus betrayed him. Uh, Blood Elves rise up against him. And they take care of business. Then... We have... Well, we spoke about Zangamarsh. And we've flown around Nagrand. Because he knew he was a baddie, that is for sure. Uh, in the Grand, well, we got the Throne of Elements. Big old, you know, as the name implies. We also got Jaradar. So, I'm trying to remember if Oshugan was the reason. Or if there was... I, I'm going to give it to Oshugan, but I'm not exactly sure. But either way, there's a reason that in the Grand, as you can imagine, compared to the rest of the planet. Like, the rest of the planet is kind of shit, right? But the Grand is all green and beautiful and basically what Outland used to be like. 
and has been spared from the majority of the corruption. So this is the place where they would keep their ill, as there was the whole rise of the Horde and the warfare. So the reason why Gerrard did not join his father, Gromash, in the Horde is because Gerrard was sick here in the Grand. So by the time that Thrall and the Horde show up again, Burning Crusade time, they go into the Grand and they find Jaradar. And Thrall finds out that his parents would have called him Goel because he finds like his grandmother. Um, I believe Jaradar was like the name of his grandfather. Garad, yes, his father, grandfather was called Garad, so Garadar, right? And um, we also run into Garrosh. And Garrosh at the time was not the orc that did nothing wrong, quite the opposite. Garrosh at the time, he was feeling guilt and he was feeling shame for carrying the Hellscream name because his dad was the first that stepped up to take the blood of Manoroth within him. The first to stand up and be like, hey, yes, I want power. Little did he know that the power would corrupt and make them slaves to the Burning Legion. And little did Gerrosh know that his father's story did not end with just being the first to step up and take the demonic blood inside of him. Um, and Thrall would explain to Gerrosh, son of Hellscream, that Gromash, yes, he did do terrible things. He did. He, he was power hungry. He would not let anybody else be more powerful than him. He would start fights with elves because he could and drink demon blood again. But, but, he also liberated their people. He was able to kill Manoroth at the sacrifice of his own life. And upon learning this, our Garrosh got more pride in the Hellscream name. And for some reason started to believe that the Horde should be like the Horde of old. Knowing this history, I kind of wonder why he would think that. But he did. And so, Thrall invited Garrosh to come with him back to Azeroth and be part of... Um, be part of this whole journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is also how Garrosh showed up at like the meeting at Fadamore and be like, this is a, a conversation fit for merchants and whatnot. Garrosh was never a Thrall. Garrosh was very much like... We should take and conquer. We are the Hordes. Um, and my hope was always that Thrall would get closer to a Garrosh. And that Garrosh would get closer to a Thrall. So Thrall would become more badass. Garrosh would become more level-headed. And we would have the most wonderful Horde ever. But that never really became a thing. Um, we've got Oshagon, the spaceship that we spoke about. There's a Demon Hunter hanging out here that's taking care of business. Um... Oh, yeah, the Burning Blade Clan. Oh, God, the Burning Blade Clan. I don't know that much about the Burning Blade Clan. Did Thrall say all of Grum's lesser points? I remember something about Thrall skimming parts of the resulting party and Garrosh did nothing wrong moments. Um, I think what you mean is... Um, I think what you're referencing is when Garrosh went to Alternate Renor during the expansion Wars of Renor and he recruited Alternate Gromash to his side and then... He had Alternate Gromash go through a ritual at the Throne of Elements, and he showed him the past. He showed him, like, I am truly from the future. Uh, this is what happens. But then, when he got to the bad parts, or when he got to the parts with, like, Thrall and Manorov and Gromash sacrificing himself, that is when he pulled him out, and he didn't show Gromash the entire story. I think that's the part. I'm pretty sure Thrall told him everything about his daddy, because they had a lot of conversations about it. Same with, uh, with Akarn. Same with... Um, like, I'm pretty sure that Thrall told him the entire history. I would have to double check it, though. Because you're making me you're making me wonder now. Um, if he didn't, then that makes it even more... ...redonkulous to make it a war chief. But anyways... Um, here is Tedokar Forest. And in Tedokar Forest, the Draenei would bury their dead. In this place called... I want to say Akundun. Yes. Because that is also a dungeon in Alternate Draenor. And as you can see, it's not as pretty as it is on Alternate Renor. It's kind of blown up. In the time of... Oh, God, what was it? When the orcs returned to get, like, powerful relics from Azeroth. Uh, at some point, they, like, released Murmur into the world. And Murmur is actually kind of an interesting creature. Uh, like, you know the elements, yes? You know about water, air, fire, earth, and all that good stuff. But did you know that there's also something... The element of sound. 
In the beginning, so far away, such phrases cannot begin to describe the elemental's origin. Its existence heralds pure destruction. Worlds shatter, and the pieces scatter at its whim. Only the truly mad would think to summon it. Perhaps there is yet time to banish Murmur before it fully enters Outland. Captain Donger, thank you very much for the Prime. Um, so they summon Murmur, and it like, kind of destroyed this place. But the Draenei are still busy, like... Collecting the souls that are part of the whatnot. We also have one of their. Oh god. Um, where are you? Because I don't have to do it from the top of my head. I got a dungeon journal. Uh, we have Exarch Maladar, who um, kind of lost it when all of this was like destroyed and desecrated. So we had to take care of him. But he's now a friendly spirit. And we also browse quickly the um, Arakoa. And the Arakoa have gotten a lot more storyline with Drenor as far as I remember. So the Arakoa are children of Anzu. Okay, so come on, brain. You have Rukmar, bird of the sun. Anzu, bird of the void. And then there was Sephic, bird of corruption or whatever. And... There was infighting and corruption and manipulation, and then they killed Sephic, but Sephic's blood was still a curse, which cursed Anzu to stop him from becoming... Uh, turned him into, like, a flightless bird. And then Rukmar was like, Anzu, Anzu, where are you? And Anzu was like, I can't show myself, I'm horrifically disfigured. And then the Arakoa, they worship Rukmar as their, like, sunbird goddess. And in their society, they started to throw those that they wanted to punish into the corrupted blood and turn them into the Arakoa, like the corrupted beings that we see. So, the whole sun-like, beautiful, perfect form of Arakoa that we saw in Alter Drenor were not really around anymore in the times of Outland. And I think that's because the Horde wiped them out. I'm pretty sure the Horde, like, killed them all. Uh, so that's the part about the Arakoa. There are a couple of them still in there, uh, but not that many. What else we got? Illyrian Strongholds, named after a certain Illyria. Um, I mean, we spoke about Akundun, the place where they kept their dead in. Kind of think that's the idea behind Tadokar Forest. Um, isn't this also where they have, like, Rufmar Village? So, I sp I've spoken about the time in which the Drenine orcs were not exactly enemies. And young Duratan, together with Orgrim Doomhammer, they were chased by an ogre. And they were saved by the Draenei. Um, to which Velen, they were, like, invited to come over to their village of the Draenei. And to have dinner with the prophets. And one part about the Aman... Atamal crystal. I'm going to say Amantul, but it's something entirely different. The Atamal crystal was used by Velen to communicate with the Naru to get them that escape from Argus. And when it did, it separated into different little crystals. Thing, chaos crystals from Sonic. All these crystals had like different things, different abilities. So one crystal would make Velen all peaceful and easier to communicate with the light. And one crystal would make you very fury filled and, and a great warrior on the battlefield. And one crystal would give them a cloaking device. So, the cloak and device one was the one used to protect the city. The one that Duratan and uh, Orgrim were invited into. And they saw how the guards, like, took away the protection. And they saw how the city was hidden. So, when the Horde rose up many years later, Duratan was ordered to reveal the city to the Horde. And the slaughter that followed does not dare mention, repeat, right? Can you imagine saving the life of someone for only that person to then come back and be like, Hello, we have come to slay your children. We have come to take your lives now. Thank you for saving me, by the way. Oh, this crystal? Yeah, this is mine now. I believe the crystal was called Leaf Shadow. Um, but don't worry, it's all due to the, the light prophecies. Don't worry about it. It's all according to plan. Because we also had uh, Valen get captured at some point and he brought two crystals with him. And those crystals were then taken by the Horde, and he was like, yeah, I was supposed to bring those. So, yeah. Hello, I've come back to Murdia now. Hello. Yeah, it wasn't the most pleasant days, I must admit. And on Outlands, you can find more of the darker stories in, in, in Warcraft, which is kind of cool. And then here, beautiful Shadowmoon Valley. 
Uh, again, Temple of Karabor. This is also where we would go through the storyline with Mayev. And um, I believe we're the ones who actually bring back Terongor, like the boss in the Black Temple. Like, Terongor was taken out by Trellian. But as he mentioned in, in, in the raid itself, he's like, nah, time has spun for me a couple of times now. I am unkillable. Ha ha. Was it Orgrim or Duratan who snitched? I think it was Duratan. I think it was Duratan who done diddly do the deed. Now, in his defense, if he didn't, then that would mean exile for his clan and most likely death. Ordenado. So thank you very much for subscribing. So basically, you know, us versus them mentality, but still. Uh, Colonel Wildhammer Stronghold, by the way, chilling here in Shadowmoon Valley. Um, Storyline with Mayef. So Mayef Shadow Song was the warden of Illidan Stormrage for over 10,000 years. And Illidan nearly killed her brother once he had like created that second well of eternity. Mayef had no love for Illidan, and so she would be his ward. Little did she know that Saranda would let Illidan go 10,000 years later. So you can imagine that Mayef was not exactly... Um, Mayev was not exactly happy with Toronto. But either way, she jumped through the portal that Illidan created at Warcraft 3. Melfjorn and Toronto, they were like, Let her go, my love. We have some procreating to do. And she has been consumed by vengeance. And it's like, really, Malfurion? Really? Consumed by vengeance? You mean doing her job? You should try that one day, buddy. Do your job. Anyways, Mayev went after Illidan into Outland. Uh, but Illidan was too clever, had demon hunters on his side, and eventually she gets captured. But we still have Akama, who is like, one day the betrayer will be betrayed. Ah ha ha. And he teams up with Mayev, and they do the thing. So eventually, Azeroth forces show up, Adal shows up, and. Uh, oh, this is actually really cool that we can see this moment here. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be allowed to get in here, but that's okay. Where was my F when Tyrande let Illidan free? Hmm. Well, Tyrande and her organization of Watchers were originally appointed as like, yeah, we're going to be Illidan's wards. But over time, they got more jobs to help uh, safeguard Azeroth. Um, because as you can imagine, Illidan was not the only criminal, right? And with Malfurion taking a big old nap, Tyrande could use all the help that she could get. So, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, she should be walking in here. So yeah, uh, Akama liberates Mayev. Mayev shows up to help us out at the top of the Black Temple and help us actually secure the kill against Illidan Stormrage. Like, Mayev, how is it even possible? Ah, my long hunt is finally over. But as Illidan had warned her, the Huntress is nothing without the hunt. And um, she would find out soon enough that Illidan had been right. But that's a story for another day. In front of us, we actually see something really cool happening. Which is... Remember how Deathwing... Remember how Deathwing had sent his ex over into Draenor? Well, something rather interesting happened. When Draenor transformed into Outland, the magics of the Twisted Nether, they went like... Bleh! Across the planet, right? And they transformed the black dragon X into the nether wing dragons so dragons infused with the powers of the nether and they had like the power to shift and shape and um glimmer in and out and a couple of things would happen with them uh some of them would be taken by Tiragosa and she wanted to help them because like I think the orcs were like abusing her there were like people on outland that were abusing the dragons and she felt sorry for them so she took them with her to the Nexus, to the, like the home of the blue dragons. But what she didn't realize is that these dragons were like really power hungry. So when they saw the Nexus, like this big old Nexus of power, they went num 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 num, which woke up their lord Malagos. And Malagos had been crazy ever since the War of the Ancients, where his flight had been betrayed by Deathwing, and Deathwing had turned the dragon soul against all the other dragons. He literally sucked the life out of them. Malagos was the one who had stood at Deathwing's side and vouched for him. So the betrayal hit him twice as hard and he lost his mind. But now with these nether, drag nether dragons attacking the Nexus, Malagos was under assault and he decided to go num 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 and he ate them. And something really magical and unexpected happened. He got his sanity back. 
Now, Tidigosa had not done this on purpose, but hey, that's, that's a nice little bonus, right? Eating dragons, you get your sanity back. And in the case of uh, Malagos getting his sanity back, he realized that mortals were abusing the magic of the world, and he was going to rage war with them. Um, but that is the story for Rolf, the Lich King, the Nexus War. In here, we also see a secondary storyline with those nether dragons, which is, I believe these are the Dragoma orcs, and we just saw Lady Sinestra walk in front of us. Lady Sinestra, aka Sinfaria, is the only black dragon that we know of that survived mating with Deathwing. And we've spoken earlier about, okay, we don't know exactly how dragons mate, but we know that there's some kind of intercourse. That is indeed Sinestra from Cataclysm, yes. So, when Deathwing used the dragon soul to betray the rest of his kind during the War of the Ancients, as I said, the corruption... It, it, it meant that he had to keep plates around him to keep himself together, right? So, when he made it with her, he did, he did, he did damage, okay? You can imagine if someone like Deathwing climbs on top of you, there's got to be some damage. And we found out that in... Boop, there she is. Um, his mates died, except for Sinestra. And that is why we know that Refion is not a direct child of Deathwing, because we know who Refion's mom is, and his mom is perfectly fine. Whereas we can see with Sinestra, she has scars that burn everlasting. Also on her face. Um, it wasn't exactly a grand old good time. Here we see her. This is still the Burning Crusade, right? Like the picture that you see right now, that is the Cataclysm. This is still the Burning Crusade. Um... In this time, she is planning on making the Twilight Dragons, and she thinks that she is doing it on her own accord. Little does she know, Deathwing is still whispering to her from the shadows. So even though she thinks she has been liberated from Deathwing, uh, not so much. But either way, she is going to take Nether wing dragons and in the book night of the dragon she's going to do experimentation and she's going to give rise to eventually the twilight dragons which is what we fight off in uh, the cataclysm with like uh, in the bastion of twilight with the twilight hammer clan twilight dragons void all the good stuff uh, not specifically void dragons though would come later in battle for azeroth if i remember right um so yeah that's what's happening here and we actually get these acts for reputation with I don't think I'm going to be able to see it. No. Uh, maybe if I go outside. Hang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all very scary. Go away. Hey! Stop it. Stop it. Don't shoot the messenger. No, no, no. Ah, oh, My faint death is on cooldown. I gotta go. Ah, leave me alone. Nope. Mm, okay. Oh, yeah. I don't have a, I don't have a mount. Okay. So, uh, we would collect those eggs and actually get reputation with the Netherwing. I think they're just called Netherwing. So, we could actually buy Netherwing Drakes to ride on ourselves, which is kind of cool. Um, we also learn more about the history, about the story. Uh, which also, once again, uh, took away part of Illidan's forces. Because I'm pretty sure that the Dragomar are in league with Lord Illidan. And then... Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think if I can actually show you that or not. Because this is basically the story of Outland, as we've covered it so far. Um, but the story would eventually take us away from Outland. It would take us to the Sunwell. But I don't think I can show you. Unless I could take the portal and Shafrath. We could find out. Are there any things that you would say, by the way? Oh, for if you're listening on, on YouTube as well, if you've gotten this far... Uh, thank you very much for leaving comments behind on things that I've forgotten about or things that I'm wondering during the during the show. Or you're like, hey, dum dum, this and this is happening. You're actually a lot of your comments so far has sparked a couple of things in my brain that I was completely forgotten about, which is actually really nice. What does the Shadow Wind story cover? What do you mean, Santazar? Uh Wouldn't they know that mating with Deathwing would very likely kill them? Oh yeah, it's not a situation in which they willingly do it bloody that's the idea behind it they don't they don't go ooh lord deathwing you're home it's more like deathwing's home get ready you know what i mean shadowing manga oh um that is the uh that's the story i just told you about uh, do I so there is the uh netherwing tiragosa storyline which is basically a continuation of the Sunwell Trilogy. And we are going to go there, so might as well talk about it. So, once upon a time, 
Arthas used Kelf Arthas used the Sunwell to resurrect Kelfuzad as a lich, which corrupted the Sunwell, and the Blood Elves, which they now call themselves, they had no choice but to blow up the Sunwell. But not all of the power was gone. Some of it still remained behind, which was collected by the Red Dragon Coriolstras, mate of Alexstrasza, and he gave it a form in a human form to hide it away. He created Envina Teague, and Envina would get in touch with Caligos, and they would have a whole adventure together, uh, where eventually there was Darkon Rafir, who was also looking for the powers of the Sunwell. Darkon was like the betrayer of the um, High Elves. He gave access for Arthas to get into their city. Um, he wanted the Sunwell as well. And eventually, Envina figures out that she is the Sunwell. And she's like, Darkon, you can't do anything to me. What are you doing? Die. Uh, he didn't die, but, you know, that's what she said. So at that point... The Blood Elves, they promise, like, we're going to keep Envina safe. She's her son well. We're going to keep her a secret. Uh, even Sylvana showed up at some point with her banshee scream to save the day. Uh, we're going to keep her a secret. However, as we've discussed, Kilfas would fall to the dark side. Ashna, hello there. Um, Kilfas would fall to the dark side. He would join Kill Jaden, and he wanted to bring Kill Jaden into the world of Azeroth. What better way to do that than with the powers of the sun well? So he took Envina, and uh, he was ready to make a portal with her. So the adventures with Envina Teague is basically comic manga. And from there out, we learn about Tiragosa and Caligosa and whatnot. And Tiragosa would eventually go to Outlands, find those Netherwing dragons, bring them back to the Nexus, and then kick off the Nexus War with Malagos eating those Nether dragons and getting his sanity back. Um, now, in the case of Envina, we would find Caligos go out for Envina and try to uh, save her. Uh, if you've done this raid before, you might recall how there's another blue dragon that gets corrupted, dominated by that uh, pit lord. Uh, they're here with Caligos. They're here to try to save today. And in the final confrontation, um, where Kill Jaden tries to come out of the portal, we try to break the spell that is over Envina. So if you look up into the sky, or you look through the... Um, Looky glass in, in the dungeon, you can actually see Envina hanging above the Sunwell. And in a similar vein as to what happened in the comics, where she realized, like, I am the Sunwell, nobody's going to make me do anything. In a similar vein, she realizes, like, I am the Sunwell, Kill Jaden is not going to come through this portal, I'm going to save the day. So she basically flushes Kill Jaden back into the portal and uh, uses the powers that she has. And she's like, Goodbye, Kaelic, my love! And Kaelic is like, Envina! No! I love you. But yeah, she was gone. She was still in his heart, mind you. Like, you know, Kaelic, magical creatures. My boy knows what's up. Um, but after that, we had also taken care of Mu'uru. And Mu'uru was that Naru sent over by uh, Kilfas for his blood elves to snack on. And... <laughs> they... <laughs> sorry. Um... They'd snacked on the Naru, and they'd taken away so much of his light that it is now turned into the darkened state of the Naru. So we'd spoken about the Naru falling ill and pulling in, like, the spirits of the ancestors. That is them trying to get back to the light side. For some reason, if you eat ghosts, you become light again. In a similar vein, if you push them too far, they become, like... I think Mu'uru became, like, Entropius, a darkened state. And obviously, there's the connection between Beladar as well, light and dark. The Naru always had this darkened, lightened state. Um, but after defeating Mu'uru, we see Velen walk up to the Sunwell, and despite the history of the Blood Elves, despite what happened with the Exodar and, and the ship and Kilfas and whatnot, um, the battle, the story was going to end with something incredible for the Blood Elves, which was a chance at a future, a chance at hope and life. They were the Sunwell was reignited with the use of the core of Mu'uru. The Sunwell was now not only going to have like the magical powers of Envina, but also the light. And the Blood Elves would have a source of power again, meaning that they would no longer have to suck on fell. They would no longer have to suck out magical powers out of the creatures. They could just be. Doesn't mean that they can't, right? Like they still have the racial, but they could just exist now. They could, they could live again. And after the many tragedies, because we talk about what the Blood Elves do with, like, the Naru draining. And the Blood Elves definitely walked on the darker side. But let's not forget what they also had to go through with an Arthas, with the plague, with the destruction of their people. If you read some of the stories with, like, a Lady Aldrin or 
uh, Arthur's Rise of the Lich King or like the Sylvanas novel. Um, the High Elves, Blood Elves, their storylines go dark, man. They go very dark. So I'm kind of hoping... Uh, do I not have a pat? Because I'm pretty sure... I mean, I don't know what level you are. You're 56. Nah, you just skilled to my level. Nah, that's not going to happen. No, that's definitely going to happen. I was going to... I was hoping... I was going to be able to show you the cutscene. But we could use the power of YouTube to make it happen instead. Um... Fury of the Sunwell Remastered. The Sunwell. Mm. A sacred fount of untold power. It saturated every fiber of our being. In the warmth of its glow, we thrived. Until the shadow of death fell upon us. So this scene right here, this is Arthas. Um, this is after Arthas has resurrected Kelfuzar with the Sunwell. But there were still a bunch of undead around the Sunwell, and they were going to detonate it, not only get rid of the corruption of the well, but also clean out the rest of the island. <laughs> Sunwell's destruction, did we realize how dependent we'd become upon its magic? How much we needed to feed? In the wake of our devastation, I named our people Cinderai, Blood Elves. My people turned to me for answers. I promised them a cure. Strangely, we found deliverance in the demon Illidan. Illidan offered new sources of arcane power, and so I joined him in Outland, pledging to return one day to lead our people to glory. But Illidan's agenda was short-sighted. I grew impatient. In secret, I began harvesting what energies I could. I had a brief taste of true power. So yeah, kill Jane and whispering to him the whole Tempest, Feek thing, Tempest Keep thing that they did. Um, where we confronted him, Shattered Glass and all the good stuff. Yeah, this remake is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. All is not lost. The Sunwell's essence endured, kept hidden by those who sought to protect it. Now, I have returned with the knowledge that sacrifices must be made before we can reclaim our birthright. I have forged a new alliance. Soon, the blessed rays of the Sunwell will shine once again and usher into this world the one who will deliver us all. Ah, I, I feel like it looks a little bit too hot because he's supposed to be all corrupty and darkness and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, this is... Um, this was the introduction. Well, this is a remake, obviously, but this is the uh, Fury of the Sunwell cutscene. It was like the introduction to the raid, to the patch. Uh, we found out, like, oh, Kilfus is still out there uh, trying to bring in Kill Jaden with Envy now with the Sunwell. Um, they used the Here's the Storm character. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. And no, not at all. Of course not, Captain Dong. It is very much appreciated. But yeah, that is uh, our tour de lore for Outland, I suppose. A uh, casual what? Hour and a half session, like it's nothing. Hope you enjoyed, everybody. Next up, Ralph of the Lich King.